Hi, I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today is the battle for the world's coldest ocean heating up. We look at how superpowers are racing to claim their share of resources lying beneath the melting Arctic sea ice. Our digital producer, Malika Bilal, juggling all the live feedback, so keep it coming and she'll keep it on the air. Malika, this issue is so much more complex than it seems on the surface. We've got economics, we've got sovereignty, geopolitics. Mm -hmm and our community members are staking their claims. So we have comments from Norwegians, Canadians, Americans, and Russians, and they all look something like this tweet from Bozy, who says, as a Canadian, I would love to claim the Arctic as sovereign. The powers that be, i.e. Russia and the US, won't let that happen. So for those of you at home, if you'd like to stake your own claim, please do join the conversation by using the hashtag AJStream. And joining Malik and me on set is Marcus King, professor of international affairs at George Washington University. He's advised the U.S. government on studies involving energy, climate, and security issues, and specifically on the geopolitics of the Arctic. Marcus, welcome to the stream. Thank you very much. We are glad to have you. Now, remember, you can join the discussion in a number of different ways, including Facebook. Just go to facebook.com forward slash AJStream and like us. And if you like us, you'll probably like some of the hashtags we're following. Check these out. Imagine an ice-free summer in the Arctic. That may not be that far off. A new report from the UN Climate Change Conference in Doha, Qatar, says that an area of ice larger than the United States, imagine that, larger than the United States, melted this year. Mainly due to climate change, this has now left the sea ice cover at a new record low. And as the ice sheets vanish, formerly unnavigable areas open up to the search for energy resources believed to be plentiful in the area. And that, of course, causes the world's superpowers to eye both the military and economic opportunities. Almost 13 percent of the world's undiscovered oil reserves and 30 percent of its undiscovered gas reserves lie in the Arctic, according to the U.S. Geological Survey. And that is worth trillions of dollars. So more than just a gold rush, the melting of the ice could also open up new shipping lanes, the Northern Sea Route and the Northwest Passage, which would cut transit times by about 40 percent. But the question is, will these economic riches lead to heightened geopolitical tensions? Joining us via Skype from Stockholm, Sweden, is Gustav Lind. He is the chairman of the Arctic Council. That is a high-level intergovernmental forum that promotes cooperation among the Arctic states. Also with us is Rob Hubert, political science professor at the University of Calgary. He's also the associate director of the Center for Military and Strategic Studies. Gentlemen, welcome to the stream. Rob, I want to start with you. There's potentially a lot at stake as the Arctic melts. We've got energy, the environment, economics. Do you see this area as the next big strategic battleground? In many ways, we can see already people already staking out. In other words, it's not becoming, it already is to a large degree. Uh, the major thing that the melt is causing is that the Arctic Ocean is becoming an ocean like uh, any other ocean with both the good and bad. And you start having that and the fact that you've got the Americans and Russians, of course, uh, as two of the key players there. And, uh, of course, it becomes much more strategic in thinking uh, on almost every count. So, Gustav, we're talking about these key players. You work with these countries to develop cooperations. Do you see tensions mounting? Well, actually, of course, the Arctic is going through rapid change, and that this is very exciting from different ways. And so often you hear about the race to the north, the new Cold War. But reality is really that the Arctic is, is very well organized. Uh, you have the Law of the Sea Convention with very clear rules over the Arctic Ocean, and also very good and positive pragmatic cooperation in the Arctic Council. Uh, so realities are much more clear, and the cooperation is much more better than some people think. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess I'd have to just sort of point out, though, by the same token, the Arctic Council has been a tremendous boon for cooperation, but it specifically does not look at hard security issue. That's within their mandate. And so part of the problem is, of course, is that we don't have any sort of over, or, overarching body that's dealing with some of the harder security sides um, that really slip away from some of the very important cooperation that, in fact, we have seen from the Arctic Are, are you talking about the militarization of the Arctic? Well, it's hard, you know, part of the problem when you say militarization, you run into the difficulty that we've got a situation with Russia. Russia, of course, is recovering economically from the disasters of the 1990, and they're rebuilding their nuclear deterrent that really isn't Arctic specific, but their geography means that they have to rebuild their submarine force, both their, their, their attack subs and their missile carrying subs, and by the very geography of Russia, it's in the north. So it's not about fights over the Arctic per se, but rather the re-entry of, uh, of Russia as a major strategic player, and, and that adds a complexity that is still being, is still being assessed, to be honest. You know, this now, reminds me of Robert Kaplan's new book, The Revenge because of Geography, actually, talking about how much that actually influences the power of various countries. I know we've got community that wants to get well, in we here. We do, and we have tweets that are speaking on just that issue. This is from A Energy News, who says, Norway has been a superpower in the Arctic. China seeks Arctic Council observer status. Will Russia, China, and the U.S. change the game? Marcus, I want to pose this to you. Is this a geopolitical game changer? Well, um, China is, is not a party to the Arctic Council, so, so they wouldn't be part of that. Um, I don't think it's a geopolitical game changer in the sense that we're not, there are hot and cold wars. We're not talking about the possibility at all of a hot war, something more like a cold war. Yeah. The example um, was just given by Rob of rearming with, within the Soviet Union, I mean, I'm sorry, within Russia in the way that they might have in the past. Um, but there are no plans, for example, on the U.S. side to militarize. So we're not going to build any additional surface combatant ships or anything. We're looking at it um, much more at this point as a um, constabulary um, mission, a as a mission for freedom of navigation, something that really the True, but I Coast mean, Guard's you know, more involved in. There's more than Coast Guard practice going on. There's military capacities increasing. You've advised the U.S. Navy uh, not to bring in any ice-capable warships. Why have you advised the U.S. specifically that way? Well, again, we, we look at it optimistically and, and think that um, th the most important thing is to allow for freedom of navigation up there, protection of fisheries. Um, if there is going to be um, oil exploration, the question is how to do that safely. So things like oil response capabilities are, are much more important right now than militarization from a U.S. standpoint, certainly. Uh, Rob, do you think it's possible to do that safely in the Arctic? Mm. <laughs> You know, this is the hard one. I mean, we've never actually had any real oil development except for the American North Slope. That was, in fact, done very successfully. But we look at what happened in the Gulf, and, of course, when you talk about oil industry, that you're always dealing with that unknown. I think The one thing I'd like to add in here, though, is, I mean, uh, I agree on the comments in terms that we do have a good system in place for oil development. The, the, the one, though, that people are starting to get really worried about, and this is where China starts playing a, a much bigger role, is, of course, if, in fact, the fish stocks start moving north as, as we've got many scientists in Canada that are saying that's exactly where they're headed and that is of course you know you use the term game changer we've almost had conf out and out hot wars between NATO members over fish we've had the uh, the UK and Iceland we almost went to war with the Spanish over it uh, that's the one that flares up real fast real uncertain and that's the one that uh, we don't know what's going to be happening in terms of uh, future stocks our community is definitely weighing in here. Uh, Gabriella says, resources in the Arctic and countries racing to claim them cannot end well. That's echoed by Mikey, who says, who controls resources is about what nearly every war is ever about. And Gustav, I'm going to direct this next one to you. This is from Neslihan, who says, could passages in the Arctic lead to disputes between nations over who actually has more entitlement to crude oil in the region? What's in the Arctic and, and could that lead to conflict? Well, of course, there's oil in the Arctic, but who can control it and exploit it is sort of well organized by the Law of the Sea Convention. So that is rather clear. And the oil and gas is rather close to the shores. I think around 90% is in the territorial waters or economic zones of the different coastal states. So things are rather well organized here. Uh, and there is of course competition between states but this is within very set rules by the law of the sea convention 
But I also wanted to say on the militarization of the Arctic, I think that is overplayed. Um, it's very much in the line of Professor King mentioned. It's more about patrolling it uh, because, of course, if we open up uh, for new shipping, you also get illegal activities. And so it's not a question of project force against other states. And I think the focus on that debate is sort of taking focus from the real issues in the Arctic. And those are, of course, how do we protect the environment now with a rapid change ice-free Arctic in 30 or 40 years, and how do we make it a sustainable living for those living in the Arctic? There is a population of 4 million north of the Arctic Circle, and of course it's a tremendous change for them when the permafrost melts, the ice recedes, and so on. So I think these are the difficult issues we have to focus on. Uh, Gustav, I want to get more to that in just a minute, but uh, Rob, I want you to, to lay the groundwork a little bit better for us in terms of what we're talking about here in resources. We've heard trillions of dollars, you know, beyond just oil, and then of course billions of dollars in saved shipping costs should these passageways open up. Talk about what is under the Arctic ice. Yeah, well, uh, let's start with a big question mark, because even on the oil and gas, every time anyone actually does any analysis, it changes. I mean, you cited the 208 study that the U.S. Geological Survey did, and that's sort of considered the, 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 the major study. But we've already discovered that, in fact, that there may be major oil uh, in the Davis Strait between Greenland and Canada that, in fact, didn't register. Um, another problem that we have, though, in terms of really working out the costs is the way technology technology is changing in the overall industry. There is talk, for example, that this new cracking technology that, or fracking technology that was used for gas is now going to be used for oil, and the United States may in fact be able to go to North Dakota and become self-sufficient. That's going to destroy any sort of economic argument for developing the North, because the North will remain more expensive economically. So when you try to figure out the money, how much is there? Man, that is the hard one until you actually start drilling, you start finding and you can get a crystal ball that tells you whether or not the Americans, in fact, are going to become self-sufficient because of what's happened in North Dakota. Uh, if you start looking on existing resources, however, we already know that Canada moved up from a zero diamond producer to become the second or third largest diamond producer strictly on the basis of northern mines. Uh, we know that there is a huge iron ore. We know that the fish are moving north. But everything underlining everything is a degree of, of, of issues in motion and uncertainty. And that, that, that's where the problems really come in trying to, to figure out, are we going for conflict or are we going for cooperation or is it going to be a mix of both? Marcus, I, I want to talk a little bit more about this passageway. If we can, can we take another shot of my computer where the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route are displayed. There we go. So we're talking about this waterway that essentially connects the Atlantic and the Pacific, the Northwest Passage, and it cuts thousands of miles off of traditional shipping routes. What kind of escalation, if any, do you see over these routes? Should they become passable for, say, a month or, or two months a year? Well, that's exactly the question is how, how soon this will happen. Um, the predominance of opinion was that maybe by 2020 there would be four months worth of, um, sea, of open sea. And so the question is, is it really economically feasible for um, freighter traffic to be moving through these passageways um, when, they're only, when they're constricted to that small amount of time per year? So right now it's not what you'd say is economically feasible. It's not? It's not right So they're now. not saving money? Not, not, not right now because they don't have enough time during the year um, to, to actually uh, achieve that. Right. Well, you know, at the heart of all of this in terms of probably the biggest losers is the environment and the indigenous people. And as we use more oil, we create more of an environmental crisis, which in this case then is going to give us more oil and destroy more land and ecosystems along the way. Al Jazeera's Fault Lines touched on this topic in the episode called Battle for the Arctic. I want you to take a look. As the Arctic ice melts, all of that oil and gas becomes increasingly available for exploitation. The ice now covers just half of the surface area it did a few decades ago. The excitement about Arctic oil and gas is part of a vicious cycle. The reason we're able to access the Arctic is because of climate change, and the reason we have climate change is because we've burned so much oil and gas. The Arctic is the canary in the coal mine. 
Well, Lisa, just before you introed that, mm -hmm. you and our community were on the exact same brain links. You mentioned the indigenous community. Gabriella says, where did the indigenous fit into the equation? We speak of the wildlife and the resources, but no mention of the indigenous population. And Peter says, please, where do the rights of indigenous people fit into this discussion and the animals and the climate? And speaking of climate, we have a video question here. Gustav, have a listen to this and let me know what you think. Hi, this is Sarah in Washington. Russian shipping companies now consider newly opened Arctic sea routes to be viable options during certain parts of the year. And most people respond to this by shrugging their shoulders and saying, hey, at least something good is coming from climate change. But don't you think that this reliance on shorter shipping routes creates a dangerous financial interest in propagating climate change? So Gustav, are we profiting off the fact that climate change is happening? Well, I think climate change is there whether we like it or not. And of course, the negotiations in Doha right now are the most important to reach a two degrees target and nothing else. But what we have to do in the Arctic Council and what we are doing is how to adapt in the region. And on indigenous peoples that were mentioned before, Arctic Council is rather unique because indigenous peoples are sitting at the tables in the Arctic Council together with the states. So you have the Sami Council, for example, you have the Inuits and you have the RIPE on the Russian uh, organization sitting next to the states discussing the future of the Arctic. So in that way, they are very much involved in our decision making in the Arctic. And I think we have very good benefits of this because we can listen to their voice and we can adapt to the situation on the ground in a more better, in a better way uh, than others. Rob, do you feel confident that at the end of all of this, indigenous people's way of life and their culture is going to be protected adequately? Well, and these are there's two really sort of opposing points right now I'd like to make. The first one is we have to recognize that with the indigenous peoples, you can't talk as one group. If you look at the indigenous people, the Inuit and Greenland, they can't get development of oil and gas going fast enough. It's tied into independence. It's tied into what they see as their future. If you talk to any member of the ICC Greenland, they will say, bring it on. We want to see development. We want it in a sustainable fashion like the Norwegians have done it, but we want it. In Canada, we're very much divided. You'll find some indigenous folks saying no we don't want it it will destroy our environment you have others say look at what the future of our children have to be uh, taken care of and in fact we need it and they point to the diamond industry as a, as, as a good example so we're split in Canada Greenland is fully in favor of it within the indigenous population a second point though that is very important this is a problem that Gustav is going to have to be dealing with and I wish him luck with it but Russia has just moved against its indigenous indigenous organization that is represented at the Arctic Council. Mm -hmm. Rapion, which represents the indigenous population in Russia, has either been delisted or, um, you know, it's not quite clear in terms of the terminology that the Russian Justice Department is doing. This is something, of course, that all members of the Arctic Council, and interestingly, even the Russian delegate, uh, protested against. But once again, we run into this sort of one step forward, two steps back, um, why the Russians are doing that right now, what that means. And I, I fear that this is, is perhaps the beginning of a very difficult uh, chapter in terms of Russian indigenous relations. And in addition to the indigenous population, uh, Marcus, uh, Phil on Facebook says, funny, but no one's worried about rising sea levels. Everyone is concerned about who will control the natural resources. And Chucks on Twitter says, I'm sure this melted ice has some negative environmental effect. How come it's the new oil that's the focus? What are, are those environmental effects uh, negative, of course, yeah, that we could look forward to? Well, um, ice um, displaces itself, so sea level rise doesn't actually affect the Arctic um, very much. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are um, the effects, again, on indigenous people's way of life. Um, mi migratory animals, for, for example, um, fishing stocks shifting to the northward. Mm -hmm. So those are the main effects um, of climate change in the Arctic. There's an award-winning um, documentary, it's called Chasing Ice, and it features three years of time-lapse video of the Arctic's vanishing landscape. Now, earlier we spoke on the phone with National Geographic photographer James Baylog. He is the man that was behind this incredible film. Before we hear from him about why this issue became so important to him, I want to take a look at a clip from the movie. I'm on the phone with Jim on one of our regular check-ins. Like, Jim, nothing's happening. It's starting, Adam. I think Adam is starting. Right? Look at that. Look at the whole thing. It all 
started in Iceland. I think I'm so certain to get wet, I'll take my boots off. I never imagined that you could see glaciers this big disappearing in such a short time. There's a powerful piece of history that's unfolding in these pictures, and I have to go back. So if I had one message to give, it would be simply that climate change is real. It's happening in real time, in real places, and affecting real people and real landscapes. So, Gustav, with so much at stake here for the mining companies, uh, the oil companies, how do you protect the environment, the wildlife, the indigenous people, and how do you ensure that all of the players are good global citizens? Well, first of all, of course, this is under, a lot of it is under national jurisdiction, so we have to have stable and good laws in all the different Arctic Council uh, countries. And then, of course, we have the international multilateral uh, aspects to, of it too, which we work on the Arctic Council to, for example, with recommendations how to prote protect biodiversity in the Arctic, with recommendations uh, how to deal with, for example, uh, black carbon issues which give a regional heating effects. And also we work specifically with indigenous groups with their language, uh, with, for example, specific uh, things like reindeer herding and other projects. So it's very important to engage the indigenous people, listen to the voices, and also to work uh, to improve their situation. Marcus, um, or Rob, I'm sorry. Rob, there are things that seem to indicate that tensions are heating. I mean, we've got ice scrapers, we've got training for war in the Arctic, we've got investment there by multiple countries. Um, we've got about a minute left in the show. What do you foresee happening if people just can't cooperate? Well, you're going to see cooperation. Let's, let's, it's not either or. But what's going to happen are these unexpected events are going to cause flare-ups. I mean, you, you have, for example, the Swedish uh, defense minister calling for new anti-ship missiles when the Russians announced they're going to buy ships from the French, something nobody saw coming, or this, this Russian move to delist Rapion. That's where we have to hope that we have these type of structures that Gustav is talking about, that they're strong enough to get us through the initial shock and reaction that we have but it's going to be these unknowns that come in and people go oh man we should have seen that coming mm. that all of a sudden outside actors start getting aggravated with each other and that's where the real danger flashpoints come from all right we are going to put this conversation on pause for just a few minutes uh, and we're going to continue it in our online post show but first malika's just got a few other leads that we're following From South Korea to Lebanon, the viral hit Gangnam Style continues to inspire copycats, but this time with a different spin. Lebanese comedian Wissam Saad created a parody called Opa Saida Style after the city Saida in southern Lebanon. Take a look. Well, through a fictional character by the name of Abu Talal, Saad pokes fun at the city's problems, criticizing it for becoming too conservative. The video went viral in Lebanon and caught the attention of a religious leader in one of Saida's mosques, who condemned it in a sermon. Others can accuse the comedian of promoting sex. Saad defended the video in an interview with Al Akbar News, saying it was not his intention to ridicule the city, adding, I am from Saida. I live in the city and spend my days in its neighborhoods and alleyways. Our next lead's from Puerto Rico, where the mur murder of a man named Jose Enrique Gomez has led thousands to mobilize online against increasing violence in the territory. Standing with all who support Todos Somos Jose Enrique, we want a better Puerto Rico, Wanda tweets. Gomez was reportedly kidnapped, beaten, and set on fire in suburban San Juan. To show solidarity, netizens, including pop star Ricky Martin, posted photos of themselves holding signs with We are all Jose Enrique in Spanish. The island's seen a recent spike in violent crime, with more than 1,100 murders reported last year. You can find more on our story on our website at stream.aljazeera.com. Lisa? All right, stay with us. The Post Show is next. 
So jump over to stream.aljazeera.com. Now on Monday in Sao Paulo, Brazil, experiencing a war of revenge between police and a prominent gang. We examine why more than 90 police officers have been gunned down this year. So send us your thoughts and questions. And until then, we'll see you online. Welcome back to the Streams post show. That was Seth, by the way. He works here on the floor with us in the studio. We're still looking at how the melting ice of the Arctic Sea may lead to a heightened tension between the world's superpowers. With us are Marcus King, Gustav Lind, and Rob Hubert. And, you know, our community has been kind of questioning some of the intentions of the Russians, have they not? Exactly. There's a video comment here. Uh, Marcus, have a listen and let me know what you think after revolve around uh, two areas. First, there is ensuring access to offshore oil and natural gas platforms. And second, there is the issue of uh, ensuring access to maritime sea lanes, especially, which has become especially important as the ice has melted and uh, more and more uh, ships are able to use the northern sea lanes to get from Europe to Asia. So the audio has dipped a bit there in the beginning, but he started off by saying that Russia is trying to ensure access to maritime uh, lanes. Are they, is that only thing they're doing or are they doing more than that? I mean, they also planted a flag in the Arctic not too long ago. So is it more than that? Right, that, that was a stunt. I mean, it, they have the um, perfect right and capability to um, exploit economically their own territorial waters. And so that's what they are doing. And the um, offshore, um, mineral and gas reserves are found within their territorial waters. Um, also, they're using their icebreaker fleet um, to, to promote um, the, their own economic gain as well. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, You're talking about their already established territori territorial right. waters. How do you go beyond that? This is something we were talking about earlier. How do you establish underwater what belongs to whom? Is there a, a scientific way of doing that? Well, there's a question about the extent of the um, continental shelf underwater. So um, th these claims are part of the tribunals that will be brought up under the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, to which Russia is a party. So these, these decisions will be decided um, at the tribunal. But briefly, could you explain for our viewers how that would happen? Uh, it, would that mean testing soil to ensure it matches it soil? Does it have to like, match your, the soil on your continent? Exactly. Or? How does that happen? It, it's um, underwater geological surveying. All right. It's a bit over my head. Yeah, yeah I know. I'm trying to figure out how that would work exactly, too. So, Gustav, what do you foresee happening in the short term? In the short term, in the long term, we know there will be no ice in 30 or 40 years in the summer. Uh, in the short term, of course, you will have greater and rapid changes. You can have storms and different things with the climate uh, changing now. So I think we have to be prepared uh, for that. Uh, and in terms and of diplomacy, that, though, what, what do you see happening? I mean, I imagine the groundwork you're laying now is going to be enormously important when we really yeah. do see the landscape change in 10 or 20 years. But a lot of the work is being done is very long term. For example, if you see to, on the northern sea route north of Russia, you had 34 ships passed last year, 46 ships transited this year. If you compare that to Suez, who has around 13,000 ships, of course, it's not very much, and huge investments need to be done. But, of course, if in the long run, you will perhaps see effects out of these huge uh, investments. But not so much traffic started now, and a lot of the oil exploitation there is talk about is also in the future. Rob, I know you want to jump in. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, a lot of money has already been spent in trying to determine. I mean, you were asking the question about who gets what in terms of the water. Right. And uh, as Gustav has said, the, the law of the sea provides the order of how you've gone. 
the problem that we're facing is, is is how you interpret that. For example, Russia is putting money and is just beginning to get the Northern Sea Route up and running. What's interesting is that the Russians are treating it as what's recalled internal waters. They say if you're going to come into the waters, that's great, but you have to have an icebreaker and you have to basically ask our permission. This is a position that the Americans oppose. It's a position that Canada, however, likes for its Northwest Passage. So, I mean, even though you have the law in place, you have on close basically setting out the laws what really is going to be the interesting points to follow and if there's going to be tension will be how you interpret it but the point is that at this point we're talking about potential there may incidentally be 47 uh, transit of the uh, of the northern sea route because there is a, a, a ice strengthened which means you can go into ice waters of a liquefied natural gas carrier this is a huge boat about a hundred thousand tons and it's going from Norway to Japan and by all accounts it's going quite successfully so that may be the first of many shipments from Norway and Russia to um, to the to the Japanese and that could be a very interesting game changer. Mm. Well, what I've just pulled up here on my screen is a sentiment that's kind of echoed by a lot of our community members. Our collective right to a sustainable environment is not being recognized in any discussion of Arctic development uh, and that's tweeted by GCHRD. Uh, but Rob I'm going to throw another one back at you. This is an interesting question from Mikey who says if the Arctic becomes the new center for oil tapping will this shift emphasis away from the Middle East? Well, this is, this is what everyone thinks. Um, if, in fact, you see a lot of oil companies, I think, are hedging possible conflict in the Middle East by going to the north. Because right now, economically, oil prices have fallen, and yet we see Cairns International drilling with very expensive programs in off the coast of Greenland. You see Shell determined to drill off the northern uh, coast of Alaska, and you see the Russians... Uh, determined to get Stockholm, uh, the Stockholm uh, uh, fields up and running. And what the thinking is, at least in, in and around Calgary, some of the talk is that the companies are doing this because they think there are so many pressure points in the Middle East right now that once, if whatever term you want to use, you have your conflict in the Middle East, all of a sudden the economic uh, realities to further these developments come forward. So I think the North is seen because, you know, the point's been made. These are stable governments and it's more expensive but more stable. So you're hedging your bets, I think, to a large degree amongst many of the major companies. Marcus, would you agree that until these resources really open up 5, 10, 20 years from now, we're not really going to understand the true nature of this situation and everybody's actual intentions? Um, I, I think that's right, but I, I wanted to make a point about the militarization of the Arctic, which we think is inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, from an environmental security standpoint, um, well, first I want to make the point that the military does not fit into the framework of the Arctic Council as it stands. They're not allowed to participate. But since the military is there, I think there are opportunities for bilateral engagement. Um, many countries are part of NATO. Um, and so there's the idea that they could cooperate on joint technology ventures, um, joint assessments, which would actually promote the environmental security and sustainability of the Arctic. Right. Rob, you want to wrap things up for us? We've just got about a minute left here. Well, it's just interesting. It, I mean, everything is so much in a state of flux. This is the thing that's so confounding. You know, where are oil prices going? NATO was mentioned. Well, you know, Norway, or not Norway, Finland and Sweden are thinking about joining NATO. What does that do for Russian relations? I mean, the Arctic is this amazing canary in, in, in sort of the mine cage, or polar bear on ice, I guess would be the better metaphor. There are so many forces at play. I mean, I think the critical point is to try to get everybody cooperating as much as possible so that when the real interests start coming forward, we're in a good position to deal with the inevitable disputes and conflicts. All right. Marcus King, Gustav Lind, and Rob Hubert, thank you so much for joining us today. Terrific discussion. Now, on Monday, is Sao Paulo, Brazil experiencing a war of revenge between police and a prominent gang. We examine why more than 90 police officers have been gunned down just this year. So we would love for you to do a little reading on this over the next few days. Send us your thoughts, your questions, your comments. Go to stream.aljazeera.com, click on the red record a comment button, and send us a video comment for the show. And until then, we'll see you online.